invite Ms. Severs to join us at the table. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming back in. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. The day before break. We have three weeks off. I don't know if they're going to be Well, shoot. I want to stay with you guys then. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you for having me. For the record, Erin Segrist with the Vermont Retailing Grocers Association. Um, just a little overview on VRGA. Uh, VRGA represents over four, sorry, 750 members across the state. Our membership is inclusive of a variety of business types and models, including general retail grocery stores, convenience stores, distributors, uh, food producers, and business services. Um, so, um, I'm here to testify on S113, um, plastic bags and other single-use disposable items are used by almost every Vermont resident and business. business. We must consider the impact of new policies not only on the environment but also the human condition as it is now and consider education and a phased approach to eliminating these plastics. While the RGA has not taken a position on straws, I would like to address the other two pieces of S113. So first of all, I'd like to talk about single-use carry-out bags. Um, S113 only acknowledges single-use plastic bags. A straight ban of only one of two options often presented at a grocery store will result in consumers taking the alternative that is still available for free. And while consumption of single-use plastic will decrease, consumption of free paper will increase. Paper bags are heavier than plastic, they require more space for storage, and require up to seven times the number of truckloads in order to transport the same amount of plastic bags. They're allowing disposable paper bags but not single-use plastic bags will also cost retailers up to six times the cost of plastic bags. So to address the environmental, natural resources, and financial effects of single-use bags, I ask the committee to consider a phased-in program to discourage the use of both single-use plastic and single-use carry-out paper bags before banning all single-use carry-out plastic bags. This is why the RGA is supporting a bill that came out in the House yesterday, H506, with maybe a couple tweaks. Um, the bill would impose a five cent fee on paper and plastic beginning, um, I believe the, the date for uh, the bill is September 1st, 2019. I'm sorry, did that come out of a, a committee or is it off? It was just in introduced. Oh, it was introduced, okay, yes. so it's yeah. not, it hasn't been passed. Yeah. Um, Thank you. So it would impose a five cent fee on paper and plastic single use carry out bags. And one year later, it would ban single use plastic bags while continuing the five cent fee on paper. The fee would stay with the retailer to offset the cost of the bags. We must allow time to educate consumers about this change, deter them from the expectation of a free <coughs> disposable <coughs> paper bag, and allow retailers to eliminate their inventory of those plastics. Um, by no means do we believe that this will make a significant impact in the amount of plastics in our environment but we have no interest and no, uh, and we do not support a patchwork of bans or fees across the state. Um, I'll, so I'll stop there and answer any questions on the plastic bag piece if you'd like. But. Do you have a per bag cost on paper and plastic, what they actually cost the stores, just a, a ballpark? So our members um, range from very small independent retailers to the large chain grocery stores. So depending on how um, how many you're purchasing, what the sizes are, um, I've had um, some, you know, the larger retailers are probably paying closer to, you know, four or five cents for a paper bag, where if you're a small retailer, you're, you might be paying, you know, 25 cents for a paper bag. Yeah. Um, as far as plastic, those are, those are probably closer to two or three cents for the plastic bags at a large retailer. They're probably um, a little more expensive for the smaller retailers. Okay. You, okay. So, pla you think plastic bags are still costing them that much? I would have thought if they're buying large volume, they've got them down to. Um, 
Those are the reports that I've okay. heard from members, yep. but again, I, I haven't heard so from all. So it's a little cheaper than paper, but where they save the money is in trucking and right. storage and mm -hmm. all that, because it's so much more condensed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Would you remind me the house number of the bill? H506. Yes. <coughs> I was going to print off copies, but I'm just going to figure it out. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Um, yeah. The, well, the center right, but I was thinking if that number was in the bill, the center those figures, four or five cents, whatever, uh, per bag for a figure of profits, that would conceivably include the cost of trucking already, right? They're, they're yep. cost, but they're, they're not as compact, so I get that place. The, I, I suppose, well, just a test it makes me think we used to always get paper, so somehow, I'm not talking about the cost, somehow it was a manageable way of doing things. I don't know what's changed in terms of, I can see that you can get many plastic bags in a tiny space at the end of a checkout counter. I think it all goes down. It all comes down to convenience, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's convenience for the consumer or convenience for the retailer. Um, regardless of, of who we're thinking of, it, you know, VRGA doesn't have a doesn't have an interest in having a patchwork. So, you know, we would prefer that, um, you know, if if some towns are are going to consider bans or fees, then um, we should do it statewide, and um, you know, we should all be on the same page, whether whether we're talking retailers or consumers. Right. 113 is the bill for you since we have a statewide proposal. <laughs> Let's keep going. Yeah. Any more questions on that? I, think we plastic bags. Um, I just want to reiterate, too, sorry, yeah. Senator, that we're coming out in support of a bill. You know, this is this is a first for VRGA in, in a number of years. So we're supportive of, of no, this. No, in favor of any bill? Well, no, 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 no. Oh, okay. Of, of okay. like a ban or a fee. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes, yeah. Um, I, I will share with you that I've worked um, rather closely with members um, for for several months to try and get um, all sizes of members um, on on to some consensus. You know, we've got large retailers and small retailers, and and you know if you're in a if you're a small retailer in a tourist town, you know you want to provide that nice handled paper bag for convenience. Um, you know, that's, it's been a, a difficult effort to get um, members to, to this consensus where, you know, we're, we wanted, we, we would prefer a charge on paper and plastic with a phased out approach for plastic. Well, I think I told the committee when we were in Hawaii, they didn't have plastic bags available at some stores and they charged 15 cents for a big heavy duty paper bag mm -hmm. with handles that was a nice reusable bag. And, you know, because we were traveling, we didn't have our cloth shopping bags that we use around here. Was it so strong I thought, enough where you could oh yeah. reuse it? Oh, yeah. It was a big, strong bag. And it was paper. And I didn't mind paying f the 15 cents for it. So I think, you know, that's a good way to get people started is start charging them, make them cover the cost of what the bag actually costs. Right now, they're getting them free. Yeah, by simply banning plastic, you're just going to... You're not you're not changing um, a practice because there's also you know if you're going to the grocery store there's paper there so you have an, a free alternative still <clears throat> so you know they're it's just shifting their practice from plastic to paper. Well, I mean, look at um, uh, a calculator for if for a given population if you shift what, if you use single use plastic bags what are the impacts how and so if, assuming that Vermonters behave like uh, Massachusetts folks that put together this spreadsheet. Um, we use something in the order of 332 million single-use plastic bags a year. It's amazing. And we see in Vermont. That in Vermont, just in Vermont. So it's a surprisingly big number. And because the average person gets 562 of them or something a year, I mean, they, who knows? Well, the but the other, other thing is, is they're not always single use. I mean, right. responsible people reuse them and, and recycle them. The problem is the irresponsible people who let them blow in the wind and go down the street. Um, and the, the cost of those was estimated at uh, 13.2 million. So they seem free, but they're just baked into the price mm -hmm. right now. So making people see what they're <coughs> buying is like, probably a helpful thing. 
Is well, even if you use them again, they do end up in a landfill, and then what happens when they do decompose? Well, our, I mean. our uh, recycling facility recycles them. What, what, so what, what happens to them? Right, I, and I don't know what happens to them. Well, so you can... The side of the road or the road in your opinion? I'm not going to say I've never seen a bag blowing down the side of the road, no. In your whole life. Consumers do have the, the, the opportunity, and I, I understand they don't, but, or a small portion of consumers do, but you know, I'm, we have a box at home, and we just shove all the plastic, mm -hmm. any type of plastic. We clean it out, shove it in the box, and we take it back to the grocery store. You know, if, if we could get, if there was some way that we can encourage consumers to bring them back to the grocery store and, and have them recycled, but I understand you know, there needs to be a consequence for your actions. I get it. So mm -hmm. this is why we say it needs to. If you're, if you want to change, if you want to change practices, you have to charge a fee. Yeah. Well, and also, if people have to charge, if people have to pay a fee and <coughs> do the math, the cloth bags aren't that expensive. It's just a change of habit to start bringing your own bags. But what I hate about any of the bans is, some <coughs> days you go out of the house and you forget your bag or you go into the grocery store and you forgot your bag and rather than not have a bag or have to run back out to the car then you would pay the however many cents it is to be able to carry your stuff out right right and you had mentioned at the, at the beginning um, outreach and education yes and I don't know if you were in the room when Brattleboro sent a representative to talk to us about the program and he was saying that was about one of the most important things they had a long phase in time and while they were phasing in on the vendor side, you know, they were lining up what are the replacements, how do you how do you make the transition smooth for shops and customers? But they did a lot of outreach um, to help people know it was coming. So it was so they were actually yes. to be a very smooth transition, <coughs> smoother than they ever thought. But it was it proved to that much a lot of work. Get people right, and and that's also something I'm. You know, VRGA is happy to assist in um, creating some type of outreach. You know, whether it's just creating a sign and sending it out to members and saying post this on your on your counter, letting members know that this is or your customers know that this is coming. You know, that that's why we did say let's impose a five cent fee. You know, there's potentially a three or four month um, lead up to say this is coming. You know, we can put those signs out saying you will be charged. And then it, you get another year to, to get out of that practice of, of purchasing a bag and get into a practice of bringing your own, and there's opportunity to educate the, the public that way as well. Have any stores just gone ahead and said, we're going to start charging a nickel uh, a bag and you already? There's several stores around the state. Um, several of the small retailers here in Montpelier actually for years have been collecting five cent fees, or five cents. You know, if you don't take a, pa a bag, mm -hmm. they take five cents out of the register, put it in a, a donation jar, and at the end of the month, they donate to a charity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they have the, um, signs at their register, bag that bag. You know, if you don't take the bag, we'll, we'll give five cents to a charity. Um, and towns around the state have been doing that for years. Are they still in business? Yes. Yes, they're still in business. Um, so the second piece of the bill gets into other forms of something yes. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so my understanding is we're talking about expanded polystyrene. Um, so um, as the landscape continues to rapidly change, whether we're talking about online shopping um, increasing or increased consumer demand for more environmentally friendly carry-out products and packaging. Um, we are encouraging the community to establish a comprehensive plastic pollution management task force with balanced representation to study ways to efficiently and cost-effectively reduce plastic waste, including expanded polystyrene. And just so you know, one of the things post uh, you know, during break <coughs> back is to look at, have we captured the, the, this bill came, was based on a, a New Jersey bill. Mm -hmm. So that was the first cut at what was in and out. But I think we're probably not identifying all the categories of plastic that we would want. I don't think the clear 
Right. The clear things that uh, a lot of food comes in on, on the side of the polystyrene. So. It is, a, but it's that was that's where I got caught up because I thought it was all polystyrene, and then I reread the bill a couple times and I said it's expanded polystyrene. So, yeah, so, so it's very good. it's a very narrow definition. Right. So um, we need to get our specs uh, through that. Yeah. Um, so regardless, we would ask that you you establish a task force um, similar to to other states, including New Jersey, um, Rhode Island, New York, and Connecticut. They've all created some type of task force or study committee to identify um, you know th those plastics and how to effectively um, eliminate those from this, the waste so stream. A working group proposing the bill, and you have some thoughts on who's in a, if you could set, share with us. Not now, but I mean, to send in, like, who's in the task force compared to who if we put in the first cut on the working group? Um, maybe we'll need someone out there to cover. Yes, I can, I'm happy to, to put a list together and send that to you. Yes. The overall timeline is to be aiming for July of next year, 2020, to have made the full transition. Does that seem about the right timing to you? I know you're talking about an immediate step charging for bags, but are you looking at that sort of roughly 15 months rollout for the whole thing? Um, meaning the plastic bag ban, plastic ban and, and the, the task force. Yeah. Um, <coughs> 15 month rollout for a plastic bag ban would, would essentially... Well, I think for everything. I mean, we're trying to do it once and be more comprehensive. Right. Uh, I mean, the fundamental problem underneath it all that we're trying to address is that plastics are in existence forever. They just don't keep going to their natural cycles and they just keep getting into smaller and smaller pieces. So right. we're looking at reducing their use more broadly. So I think the 15 um, month timeline reflects what we had supported in H506. Oh. So I, I don't anticipate that we would push back on that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I will. I'll send you my testimony. I have, you know, there are um, other points about the work, the task force, but just to keep it short, we would ask you to consider a task force, and I will send you um, a list of those who I would I would like to be, um, you know, a part of that that discussion, and I can send other suggestions as well. Okay. So. Thank you. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, I mean, from retail to grocers was named in our first yes. uh, sort of list of potential participants, but. It's <laughs> yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Jefferson Airplane on there. I'm missing the exact connection. I don't know. 1969. Plastic fantastic one. Thought he was headed down a rabbit hole. <laughs> it's well before my time, yeah. sorry. <laughs> All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Same Appreciate year, it. That All right, well, that's the perfect segue <laughs> to <laughs> inviting this side of the table. Uh, uh, good morning. Good morning. That's right. <laughs> um, Jen Duggan, Conservation Law Foundation. Um, Conservation Law Foundation, one of our um, priority programs is our zero waste project. And um, that project aims to reduce waste and protect communities from unsafe waste disposal practices and um, protect against plastic pollution. So one of the top goals of that project is to ban um, single-use plastics that can't be recyc recycled. And so we strongly support um, this bill. Um, I wanted to start, before talking about the specifics of the bill, just to take a step back and talk about the life cycle costs associated with plastic pollution. Um, I think, did Judith Inc. Um, provide the committee with a copy of the hidden cost of plastic pollution? Did she? No, if I could, if you said something in that. Okay, great. So I just... I don't make copy. Great. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, so I think... I just want to call your attention to this, and I'm happy to, um, if it hasn't been sent to you, just to make sure that you all get it. But this is a really comprehensive report. Okay. So that, I'm sure I have So this report does an excellent job of walking through the different costs associated with plastic throughout the whole life cycle. 
Um, and I have a page that I'll just hand you while I'm talking. Um, we had another witness. Oh. oh, thank you. I like diagrams. <laughs> um. Well, I appreciate your looking at it from a life cycle point of view because we, and that's like a recurring theme for this committee, is to try to break out of looking at things so narrowly that we uh, don't make the why is this Agree. I think that when you are tackling really complex systems problems like plastic pollution or toxic chemicals, you really have to look at the big picture. Um, and plastics in particular, I think it's incredibly important. So, you know, we, I think we're all familiar with those very overwhelming and emotional images of plastic um, pollution um, in the ocean. Um, the big swaths of plastic, um, the the marine life that's been impacted by plastic, and you know we know, you know, folks have estimated that there's going to be more plastic than fish in the ocean by 2050. Um, but that really is just the tip of the iceberg, and this report really walks you through that. So plastics are, you know, we start from um, what plastics are made of. They're made um, using petroleum products, and it's often sourced from fracked gas, and so that extraction process releases toxic substances into the, our air and water. Um, there are over 170 different um, fracking chemicals that have known human health impacts, um, cancer, uh, neurotoxicity, um, reproductive and development toxicity. So this, the process of just extracting um, the petroleum <laughs> to make the plastic um, is dangerous. The refineries and the plastic manufacturing process itself releases um, carcinogenic, carcinogenic and um, other highly toxic substances into the air. These facilities are often located in um, low income or minority communities, so there are equity issues associated um, with the production of plastic. Um, they break down into um, dangerous microplastics that can cause real harm to both humans and wildlife if they're ingested or inhaled. If they don't end up in the environment, they go into a landfill um, or an incinerator, again, other sources of really dangerous pollution, and also, again, more likely to be cited in a community, um, in an environmental justice community. And there is a real climate connection here with um, the production of plastic. Um, we use fossil fuels to make plastic. The manufacturers emit greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there are greenhouse gas emissions associated with transport of the raw product, finished product. Um, and we now know that plastic that sits in oceans and landfills emit um, uh, methane and ethylene as they degrade, and those are greenhouse gases. So I just, you know, want to. I think it's important to kind of hold these life cycle costs of plastics when we're talking about um, this, this bill. Um, you know, we can't recycle our way out of this problem. We need to recycle as much as possible, but it's not enough. Um, many um, plastics can't be recycled due to their chemical makeup. We know that um, plastic bags and some other um, plastics cause contamination of the recycling stream, so it impairs our ability to actually do the recycling that we can do. Um, and life cycle costs are not eliminated with recycling. So even if we reuse a single-use plastic bag or we recycle something, all of the costs associated with making you know that product um, are still there for you know for society in those communities. So the diagram I passed out kind of walks through some of the public health impacts, you know, for direct exposure. But this doesn't even talk about um, the impact to wildlife, the impact to the environment, or the climate change connection. This is really just looking at even a sliver of what we're talking about as the public health impacts from direct exposure. So the the bill itself, I think that single-use plastic bags, straws, and the um, polystyrene foam are really some of the most important um, 
plastics to tackle first. Um, you know, even though technically we can recycle single-use plastic bags, they don't get recycled. I think, you know, we folks have different figures for this, but recycling rates are about 7%. Um, they are one of the top sources of contamination in curbside recycling programs. They tangle in sorting equipment, they slow lines, they increase costs. Um, they are a major litter problem. Um, they're one of the top um, uh, types of trash that are found in beach um, and land-based litter cleanups. They cause harm to wildlife. They can be flushed into sewer systems. Um, uh, clog catch basins cause problems for cities and towns um, and their municipal infrastructure. Um, and they, they aren't free. I mean, retailers pay for the bags, um, and that cost is passed on to consumers. Um, you know, I would just note that we agree um, uh, with Ms. Segrest about the need for a fee for paper bags. You know, we we believe that um, we should move forward with a ban on single on the single use plastic bags, but also charge a fee on the paper bags, so that we're really incentivizing that shift um, in behavior to truly reusable bags. Um, so that's one thing that we would we would recommend. Um, with respect to um, polystyrene, um, it's one of the most dangerous plastics that are sold on the market. Um, you know, it breaks down into small particles that can be um, dispersed pretty quickly into the environment. Can I ask you for an example of that, the polystyrene? Is that like? Like the food containers. And, and like the styrofoam Expanded ones the foam. Ones? It's, it's the, it's this, the, the bill looks at the foam, the okay. polystyrene foam. Okay. So yeah. it's like the white styrofoam yes. containers. Yes. Okay. I guess part of the little beads. Yeah. Um, and you have to know, not necessarily your job, the, the clear plastic ones that we see, do you know what they are? I um, don't know, but I can get that answer for you. Um, so we're going to be talking to someone from the dark container corporation. I'm here. Oh, okay. You're here. Um, so we can yeah. get educated on that. Um, so it, it, you know, it can break down quickly, which is part of, even though it can technically be um, recycled, this is one of the challenges. It can't be recycled if there are, if it's not clean. And so if you're using it for food, you've, you've contaminated it. Um, it also crumbles really quickly. And so, you know, it has no value as a raw material. So if you think about what we're recycling, glass, you know, things that are most valuable, you know, that has a value as a raw, as a raw material. This, this does not. Um, and it's very energy intensive recycling foam, this particular type of foam. Um, so effectively, it really is not um, recyclable. Um, it also, you know, part of the process in building this type of foam um, uses benzene, and that's released during the manufacture um, and incineration of this. If it does end up in an incinerator or in the environment, it also has dangerous toxics um, in this product as well. And then the last thing I'll, you know, touch on is the is the straws. You know, these are also in the top of every beach cleanup. Um, they pose a serious danger to wildlife. Um, they break down into microplastics. They're too small, really, for recycling equipment, and so they mostly end up in landfills and in the incinerator and the environment. And really, the vast majority of straws, you know, except for, med you know, where there's a medical condition or disability, they're just unnecessary. Um, there are, and there are lots of alternatives that are widely available, metal straws. Um, so I think that, it, I mean, we're kind of talking about a pretty simple concept. You know, if a product um, that, you know, causes harm to public health, uses a lot of toxic products, and it's not going to degrade, and we're, it should never really be used for a purpose that is for a matter of seconds. And so, you know, this is a pretty simple concept. Um, my five-year-old daughter understands this. You know, we had a conversation and we about straws, she is always, you know, always wanted a straw, always asked for a straw, didn't really understand why we don't have straws in our house or why we didn't get one when we went to the restaurant. So we had a conversation and we talked through um, what it takes to create this, what it does, where it ends up in the environment, 
And she said, why would, you, why would we ever use this? Like, she got it. It's a pretty simple concept. Um, so, so you're saying we don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> got a problem here. That's right. That's exactly what I'm saying. Exactly. In a very sweet, nice <laughs> So I think that, you know, looking at, it's not just about, this isn't just about litter. Um, you know, you are, yes, we are reducing waste. Um, but we are addressing social inequities and in the waste dis and how we dispose of waste. Um, you're reducing upstream impacts. You're actually improving the recycling system because you're dealing with things that contaminate um, recycling streams. And you know there are there are cost savings associated um, with getting these out. You know of our of our system. Um, there are some numbers from California. California was the first state to enact, it's the only state that has a, has a statewide bag ban. Um, and just in, in beach and cleanups alone, it's saving them millions of dollars every year. Um, so there is, you know, there is a cost savings. So it's a direct economic cost savings in addition to all of the benefits associated with reducing upstream impacts as well. Um, so, the other thing I'll just I'll flag is that states and towns are moving towards addressing single-use plastic, and it's really evident when you look at sort of the state of play with respect to bag bans across the U.S. Um, and in New England. And so, you know, California is um, the only statewide ban. They've had that in place since 2016, but. <coughs> Senator, you mentioned Hawaii. Every county has, they've done it, they've basically done a statewide ban through their county bans. Um, every county has banned bags. Um, New York, New Jersey, and Washington, they, their leadership has all said, we're going to do this, we're moving towards getting this done. Um, in Vermont, there are multiple towns that are moving forward um, to ban bags. Um, Brattleboro, um, you know, I thought it was really great to hear that. Um, he, he basically, the gentleman from Brattleboro testified that they were surprised at how smoothly it actually went. Like this is not, was not as a big deal to actually implement this. Um, <coughs> there are, in all of the other New England states, statewide legislation has been proposed. Um, in Massachusetts, almost 40% of the population is, lives in a town that has a bag ban. Maine, about 20% of Maine communities live in a town that have a bag ban. Um, Rhode Island, about 25% of towns have already passed um, bag bans. <laughs> Connecticut, seven towns with 17 more working towards a ban. So this is really sort of the movement um, to eliminate single-use plastic starting, you know, with tackling some of these the most serious problems, but also pretty low-hanging fruit also. Um, so the two, the, the two sort of suggestions that we would have with respect to the bill um, would be to require a fee for paper bags, um, as I mentioned before, to incentivize really the shift to reusable um, bags. And then um, the one other thing I would call your attention to is the language related to straws. Um, in section D on page four, line one through four, I think that we would have a concern that this, we, we would not want to create a system where an individual that needed access to a straw for medical reasons or a disability would be required to prove that they have a medical disability in order to get a straw. And so we would recommend um, a slight amendment to Section D to basically say that no food service establishment um, shall sell or provide a plastic straw to a customer except that in order to provide accessibility options for persons with disabilities and medical requirements, a food service establishment shall provide a single-use plastic straw to a person upon request. And so I'm happy to send that specific um, suggested amendment. I think the, sure. we just want to avoid a situation where an individual has to 
um, where an establishment might require proof before handing out a straw. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I know it's actually a sensitive topic that mm -hmm. we face with testimony. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. We'll speak on behalf of like, the uh, disability community who can fill us in on how yep. The goal was to make sure that there wasn't a liability on the part of the establishment to right. prove or disprove that someone was eligible or not eligible. That's right. And I think the inclusion of that second field, uh, due to a disability or medical condition, is to try to get the requester only to request right. if it was for that reason. But how the two behavior, so we'll have to be careful and keep working on it. Absolutely. Um, so with that, I mean, that those are our comments. We appreciate the work of this committee in tackling this important issue and and we would we strongly support um, the bill in basket for editing um, the goal is by the way just so that people know that when we have a week to a cost over when we get back and um, that we'll finish the work on this bill and move on great um, during that week. Thank you again. Uh, I'd like to invite Mr. Pope to the table. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, sir, and committee members. Thanks for the And if you could just identify yourself for the record once you settle. Yeah. Um, yeah, I slipped and fell when I got out of the car and hit my head on the ice, so I'm, if I am a little dizzy, I apologize. Um, my name's Paul Poe, P-O-E. I'm with Dart Container Corporation. We're based in Michigan. We're one of the um, largest uh, manufacturers of uh, food service products in the world. We make um, around 2,000 products, everything from a foam cup to red solo cups, paper products that are if you get a hot cup at uh, Starbucks, you know, that's 10% plastic. It's lined with polyethylene because it would leak otherwise. And we make compostable and all of our products are recyclable. Um, I do appreciate the opportunity to, um, to address uh, Senate Bill 113. And I did submit my uh, written testimony to uh, the clerk so I, if you don't have it, I hope you get it. If you don't, I will, I will provide it to you um, in, in due time. Um, yeah, thank you for the electronic submission. Because that way we can post it, and people who aren't here can also talk about it. Oh, yeah. And I, I appreciate that as well, because I can post it instead of bringing 20 copies or whatever and wasting paper. But um, uh, Senate Bill 113 is... Um, not dissimilar to um, a few bills in uh, the Northeast. I, I cover government affairs and environment. I'm a chemical engineer and lawyer for DART. I do government affairs. I cover Maine to, to Virginia over to Ohio. And, and 113 isn't that dissimilar from some bills we've seen before, where it's pretty top heavy. It's plastic bags, EPS, expanded polystyrene, and straws and it's the opinion that I would put forth is that when you have a bill that has this many products one or another should not uh, rise or fall on the merits of the other if you want to address plastic bags address plastic bags if you want to address polystyrene address polystyrene straws address polystyrene or uh, straws. So it, it, it's our position, and, and I've, I've got a lot more to say, and, and I'll let you guys they'll let me talk <laughs> until you're tired of hearing me. But, um, but it, it's my opinion, and we make everything, we don't make plastic bags. We make expanded polystyrene foam service, um, and we can talk about the other EPS that's in the market. If you buy a TV or a computer, it comes in those blocks, and um, those tend to be the beads that will break apart when you pull a TV or something out. If you have um, a Starbucks coffee cup or a, a, a Dunkin' coffee cup and you squeeze it, 
it's not going to break down. And a lot of people conflate uh, two things. One, uh, I heard earlier today, microbeads. Microbeads were something that had been banned, and they were in um, uh, <coughs> personal hygiene products for skin, you know, scrubbing your face and stuff like that. Um, polystyrene does not break down into microbeads. And that's a, a, a new word that people are using to conflate. Um, Just so I jump in, I think we've been talking about uh, microplastics, not microbeads in here generally. Okay, well, I, I thought I heard microbeads. I, like I said, I slipped and fell earlier, so who knows what I heard. Um, I, but I just want to say micro beads are not in uh, expanded polystyrene. When we make expanded polystyrene uh, food service, it comes in two forms. Extruded, which is in the bill, and expanded. Expanded, uh, there are beads that are put into molds. There's a blowing agent that's not a CFC, not a chlorofluorocarbonate, uh, to make it. Uh, and the other is just a sheet of plastic that comes out and then is cut and molded into like a paper plate. So there, there are no beads that come off that. It's, it's the difference between what's come to around a TV and a food service product is a degree of temperature and pressure. And so we make our products with higher pressure, <coughs> higher temperature. The things that come around TVs are just quickly made, and so when you pull that thing out, the little beads get everywhere. And those are not food service products. Uh, we, we recycle all of those things, um, and it's all expanded polystyrene. And as I said, we make 2,000 different products uh, for food service. One of those is red solo cups, and you know red solo cups. The material that goes into a solo cup is the exact same material that goes into a foam Dunkin' Donut coffee cup. Number six, if you look on the bottom, you'll see a six in running arrows, and that people often confuse that for uh, a recycling uh, symbol, but it's just a, a industry symbol for six is um, uh, polystyrene. Five is polypropylene. And PET, HDPE, all the plastics have their own number. So um, that's, that's not to be confused. Um, and that's not to say that um, polystyrene isn't recyclable, because it is. Um, and so we're trying to stop it from being created. And, and it's not created here in, um, in uh, Vermont. I understand uh, that. And, um, and neither is um, a hot paper cup recyclable in Vermont. I, I know your recycling coordinator very well in um, Chittenden County. She came up from uh, Providence. And, I don't know who that is. <coughs> um, uh, Jen Holiday. Holiday. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have a, uh, a progressive uh, recycling program in Providence, at, um, which is the, um, it's a, the, the only statewide uh, recycling program in the country for polystyrene, including expanded polystyrene. So, um, and, and I'll get on to a few other things. I don't want to get bogged down in, into too many details. So Absolutely. Nomenclature, technology, whatever. Extrude. So, what's an example of extruded polystyrene? Okay, expanded is when you have beads, they're put into a mold, and you have a blowing agent that inserts air. A, a foam cup is 95% air. It, it ex beads expanded, they're in a mold, and they pop them out, and they go around. Um, extruded is a um, form of polystyrene that comes out in like a sheet. And then that sheet is put on molds, um, like for paper, um, expanded poly, uh, extruded polystyrene plates, that sheet comes out, it goes onto a mold, and it's cut in the form of a sheet. 
So the underlying material is the same, but the process to manufacture varies. Yes, and, and, and the same with rigid polystyrene, like a red solo cup, exact same material. It comes out and then it's uh, formed into the cup. So, but, but they are all the same number six polystyrene. Mm -hmm. so, um, so again, this bill attacks, not attacks, but addresses plastic bags, polystyrene, and straws. And like I m mentioned at the beginning of my comments, they should all stand or fall on their own merits. You know, if you don't like plastic bags, polystyrene or straws shouldn't fail. If you don't like straws, the other two, and, and all the way through. They, I, it's our position that, and we make everything but the plastic bags. We, we, we do not make plastic bags. Um, and, and as was mentioned uh, just prior to when I testified for incinerator, um, all that is in expanded polystyrene or any polystyrene, it's an organic chemical. It's C8H8. There are only uh, carbon and hydrogen molecules that are in that. And if it's incinerated at optimal you know, levels, you're only going to get water and carbon dioxide. There's nothing else that should come out of that. There, there shouldn't be. If we pass this, is this negatively impacting your business? Is that why you're here? I'm no. just trying to understand why. I mean, it's not no, negatively no. impacting your business. Did you fly come here from Michigan? No, I live in New Hampshire. All right, so you came here from New Hampshire. Uh, you just this is just it's it's good. It's, it's a conversation that I want to have today. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. And and like I said, we make we make. Do you have a representative in the building? Do you have a lobbying organization that you that represents you? Uh, in in um, in Montpelier. No. Okay. So just just me. Okay. Yeah. So it's and negatively impacting your business, not going to negatively impact your business at all if we take this step. It could. It, just, yeah. it could. It could. Okay. But, but I'm here. Um, just to have a and, conversation. And we don't, um, and if you ban these products, mm -hmm. um, we have other products we could sell. Mm -hmm. But, I'm, I, and I want to get into the life cycle analysis because I think there were some things that were um, not exactly um, the way we the way science sees them, uh, the person before me I had, I had mentioned, and, and I do want to get into that. You see them uh, differently than science sees them? No, we, I, our sci the science mm -hmm. behind them, mm -hmm. it takes less energy, less natural resources, less water, and less transportation cost to make a foam cup because it's 95% air. It, does, it is made of a hydrocarbon. I, I won't. You know, there's no denying that. But because it weighs less, takes less energy, less water, does not emit as much greenhouse gases in the production of a product, uh, which was said uh, prior to my taking the, my this position at the table, so that, I, that I needs. I don't want to know, but I, I'm not going to understand what you're saying. But I don't ask less than what. Um, so we so we make foam cups and we make paper cups and I'm not here to deride either one because you know a, that paper cup you have right there is 10% plastic it's lined with polyethylene if it weren't when you put a hot beverage in there it would seep out immediately that takes more natural resources more energy more water and a higher transportation cost and higher greenhouse gas to produce and often it's double cupped so that's double and so when it goes into the waste stream it's if you have one cup it's two and a half times by weight and volume going into a landfill and if you don't recycle which most folks most recycling programs do not uh, recycle a paper cup it take it, it there's a double cost because, a, say, a foam cup is a penny. That's three or four pennies for a cup. The lid is another double that. I'll take the lid off. So on the front end, if you buy a dollar, let's just make these easy numbers. If you buy a cup of coffee for a dollar 
in a, in a penny cup a dollar. That same dollar cup of coffee in a paper cup would be a dollar five. Someone on the consumer end is going to have to pay the extra cost, whether it's the retailer or it's the consumer. So if your landfill or your MRF or your recycler cannot handle that paper cup, it's going to go into the land uh, stream, the landfill stream. And so because it's two and a half times by one to one comparison, you're going the muni municipality that has to get rid of that cup, if they don't recycle it or if they don't burn it, is going to have a higher tipping fee. Okay, so two and a half times interest weight? Weight and volume weight. going into a landfill. Okay. So there's a higher cost to the consumer retailer on the front end, a higher cost to the municipality on the back end if you don't recycle it. And if you had, I, I, and, and if you mandate or you want people to use um, um, compostable <coughs> products instead, those products which we sell, again, um, come from China, uh, so that would be an imported product. And compostable products, I, most, if not all the compost, composting facilities in Vermont do food, food service, food, food uh, waste food, or yard waste, not food service products. So if you're going to uh, mandate or require something to be um, alternative, recyclable or compostable, I would suggest that before you do that, you're able to compost food service or you're recycling food service that eliminates a product. I think what we've heard generally, I mean, thank you for bringing up compostables. <laughs> mm. uh, what we've generally heard so far, uh, and I've heard in other years, is that most compostable things in real world conditions there, they don't decompose. Um, the, the conditions aren't right. It's warm, too cold, anaerobic, whatever. Mm -hmm. Some of them also break down to microplastics, depending on what they're made of. They may compost, but they may compost enough so that you can't see them, but they're still there. So, so if you uh, if you choose not to compost or try to uh, put food service wear into composting facilities, is that what you're saying? because they will break down. And, and, and we agree that microplastics is not the issue here, uh, or microbeads or... Not or microbeads, yeah. Tiny pieces of plastic, they call microplastics, but some of the compostable stuff only partially breaks down. It doesn't, mm -hmm. and once it's into the soil, it doesn't continue to break down. It, stay, it remains there as a microplastic, a tiny particle of plastic. Okay, uh, are, now are we talking about trying to compost it or just as litter either way okay so as litter you know the um, city of San Francisco they did ban foam food service wear and one of the only cities in the US that did a, a follow-up study they found they did a one-to-one -one litter survey and it, it all breaks down to consumer behavior and they found as much litter uh, from paperware or compostable wear on the street as they did from foamware before the ban went into effect. So unless you change consumer behavior, that's, that, that, that's still going to be a problem. And, and I don't disagree with you. Um, as far as landfills go, um, they are pretty much, not pretty much, they're legally required to be hermetically sealed. And for you know any um, anaerobic digestion, you need air, you need heat, and you need uh, some kind of movement. In in modern day landfills, a foam cup, paper cup, a newspaper, a banana peel. Uh, if you open it up in a hundred years, they'll still be there. So the foam cup is 95% air paper cup is two and a half times more weight and volume by itself. So it's going to take more space and volume in a landfill 
if you have modern landfills. So that's, that, that's just one issue. Um, Can you explain the volume thing? I don't know how this cup compared to a bump cup would be a different volume. Because that has no air in its body. A foam cup is 95% air and only 5% resource. That is 100% um, uh, cellulose from a paper product and 10% polyethylene line. So if I compare the amount of polyethylene line with the paper cup to the amount of polystyrene in I, I, I can get that for you, but I know that any paper cup that serves for a, there are cold service paper cups and hot service paper cups. That's a hot service. Any hot service is a minimum of 10% polyethylene. It's lined on the inside and the outside, so it won't leak. Okay, so 10% by weight. Um, no, just, uh, yes, for that, for a paper hot product, yeah. But when you crush that, I think mine, you know, like if that one's crushed, it's, it's like a foam candy. One. Yeah. <clears throat> the other one's been crushed to a smaller piece. And then Once you squeeze the air out of it. Once you squeeze the yeah. air. Yeah. Oh, can I, I have some show and tell. Do you mind if I go over here? I, I'll be quick about it. About yeah. Five more minutes? Sure. Do we have another one set for this or is this going um, the other, so in terms of comparing, so uh, it's good that we're learning about the, one of the things we want to do is make sure we do as much systems analysis that we don't push people into something uh, that is actually an environmental negative or public mm health -hmm. negative. So our, let's say this is not an ideal substitute, what is a more uh, benign substitute for an expanded policy? Uh, I mean, uh, there is there, there is no product made, whether it's a, a plate that can be washed or a foam cup or a paper product or a compostable product that does not have an environmental cost. Yeah, I mean, of course, and, and they all have environmental cost. I mean, is yeah. there something more uh, environmentally friendly or public health friendly than polystyrene? I don't know if you're saying this is not a good substitute. So, Stainless steel. Yes. But, but we but, but that product there, um, I have a bill in um, Maine right now where they would, they prefer that if you go into a restaurant, you bring that or you bring your own plate or whatever, but there are health, mm -hmm. uh, state health requirements Absolutely. because who knows what's on that plate. If you have botulism, if you have flu or if you have what, um, yeah, I wouldn't want people bringing their own cups into my restaurant. That's, that's and, and so that, that that's that was a concern yeah. there, and they and they realized that. But um, okay. well, so we don't have that book here. So no, no, I, but I'm just saying if you if you wanted to think about everybody bringing in their own food, or if you want to bring your own Tupperware or whatever, um, I'm mixing my New Jersey and my New Hampshire accent, so I, I apologize, but um, so. What happened, this is, this right here is about a pound. This is about 125 foam cups in densifiers. If your uh, food service established, if your MRF has a densifier, they collect foam, they squeeze it, put a little heat on it, and it comes out in like these big logs, ingots, and they stack them on pallets. And then this is taken back and turned into these little beads, and you guys can look at these if you want. This is about one 16 ounce cup. Yeah, we prefer you not leave the litter. <laughs> I, 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 nor do I, nor do I. Um, that's not what I'm here for. Um, but this is, and then they take this, and the market is in Princeton, New Jersey, for example, they have a company called Princeton Molding. And if you've ever gone to Target or Walmart or any place like that and bought a picture frame, it's all recycled polystyrene. It comes out like this, mm. or a quarter round crown molding. If you go to um, Lowe's or Home Depot and see the, the green crown molding, like could, that's probably real wood because we're in Vermont. But if you buy that, it's green. It's all recycled polystyrene. 
So um, it has a better, and I'll end on this, it has a higher life cycle analysis for water, paper, uh, water, um, uh, energy, and transportation costs. It's recyclable. And, and one other thing that's very important to know that if, if you have a business, like you said you had a restaurant, and no, it, I don't have a restaurant. Oh, oh. I said if I had a restaurant, oh, okay. I'm sorry. people bring in their own cup. Yeah. <laughs> if, 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 if you have a restaurant and you know your market um, prefers some kind of compostable, whether it's composted or not, but if you're trying to drive your food service toward a certain market, you can use whatever you want. And they make that decision, even though it costs them more. But there are mom and pops stores, there are uh, bodegas, there are Korean delis, folks that have a very thin margin that should have the ability to choose what service, food service packaging that they need to stay in business. And so there, there are those um, small businesses, and then you have your um, Meals on Wheels, you have your hospitals, you have your um, uh, correctional facilities. You have other folks that make no money, but try to deliver a service with food to the lowest disadvantage. And, and for them to stay in business, a one cent product versus a 10 cent product can make all the difference. Okay. Um, in terms of, uh, you were talking about cost and energy use and stuff like that. I, I, I'm wondering if, Always, when we're measuring costs, it's always good to make sure we know what how we're doing the math. I, I don't know if that, if you've seen this kind of chart that goes from extraction, transport, refining, and manufacture, continue use, and then waste management. So, a full life cycle. Are you when you're quoting costs? Are they full life cycle costs, or for a particular transaction within the whole chain of things? From birth uh, to. Uh, cradle to grave, and I and, and I don't have that with me right now, but I'll, I will submit that to you and and, and get it. It's um it's not our study; it's an independent third party uh, uh, study where they just look at um, one to one comparison. So I I'll be happy to submit that to you. Okay, great. That would be very helpful. Okay, any other questions for Mr. Pope? No, thank you. Well, thank. Uh, have a safe trip back to your car and home. And, uh, I know. I, I'm, I'm. You can see my bloody looks like knuckles. Like you took a pretty good dump. Well, I really caught myself here before I really hit my head. So that was. Um, I wore my my fancy shoes instead of my. Um, do you call them creepers here? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Practical shoes are important. Yeah. I wanted to look for, uh, uh, right for the job. So thank you very much, and 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 I'm happy to follow up with any questions, and I'll get you the LCS.